Hello everyone, today on the final bar, Apple down 4% today. Does weakness in mega cap technology mean weakness in the broader indexes, the S&P and the NASDAQ? Breath conditions deteriorating here in the short term, but one S&P sector showing new signs of strength. Finally, Ariwald of Oppenheimer will be joining us from New York. Why small caps may be the chart to watch here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey everyone, welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist at StockCharts.com here in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the action in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. The technical toolkit, in my opinion, is a practical set of tools to help you address some very clear behavioral biases. Whether you like it or not, we as humans are hardwired to make some pretty poor decisions with our investments. But technical analysis is here to help by you following a good routine of analyzing charts, of focusing on particular signals and levels. I think you can combat the uh, negative forces of behavioral biases and uh, live to invest another day. As you can see here, we're back to the normal attire in the Pacific Northwest sweater weather here. We're sort of in the, in the mid 60s, upper 60s at, uh, at best. And it's interesting, there's a bit of a chill to the markets once again uh, as well. Some of the major leading uh, technology names down a bit. Now, is this the end of the world? I think my guest today, Ari Wald, will probably say no. We'll look at some of the longer term charts, particularly some weekly charts, which help you recognize how the short term transition period that we're in now fits into a longer term, but potentially still bullish thesis. With all that in mind, let's get to our market recap and talk about what happened today and how that fits into the big picture. Before we do so, let's start with a poll question. As a reminder, you should all be subscribed to our YouTube channel. We're almost to 100,000 subscribers. Won't you be the next one to help us get to that key milestone? That would be a big help. Like this video while you're at it. And we asked you recently, will September 2023 be a positive or negative month for the S&P 500? I love simple questions that make you think. That is the goal I think of uh, of, uh, for investors is to really focus not on complexity, but on simplicity. Think of a basic question like that and think of the information you may want to have available to try and answer it. 57% of you saying a negative month, 43% of you saying a bullish month. Now, if you're in that positive month category, bad news for you is you're fighting a lot of market history because the seasonality would tell you September's actually uh, pretty, pretty rough. We've had Jeff Hirsch uh, from uh, the Stock Traders Almanac on the show a number of times uh, over the last couple of years. And we had him uh, on, I want to say, the fourth, third or fourth quarter of last year. And I remember he talked about the uh, midterm election year, like 2022, the pre-election year of 2023, sort of laid out this roadmap. So far, it's followed the seasonality incredibly well, particularly strength in the first half of the pre-election year, which we've seen, and then weakness August into September. September actually tends to be a pretty rough month. If you look, a lot of major uh, pullbacks a lot of major market bottoms happen in September, October sort of time frame, and that could set us up for a strong uh, fourth quarter. We'll see how things play out. I would agree with those of you saying September is most likely a negative month uh, because I would say that that second half of August is setting us up for the next leg down, I think, which may have started now. Let's look at the S&P and the other major averages today and see what we learned. The S&P down about 0.7%, finishing the day still below 4,500. Yesterday, we closed just narrowly below 4,500. Today, a little bit further to the downside. Finishing the day just above 44.65. The NASDAQ composite down 1.1%, and the uh, mid-cap and small-cap uh, S&P index is down about 0 0.2 to 0.3%. So uh, outperforming a little bit the uh, large-cap S&P, but still a little bit uh, slightly down. The VIX actually popping back higher. We've talked about the volatility environment and how we've come back to sort of a low volatility environment, sort of the low teens for the VIX. And that's really more characteristic of a protracted bull market phase. Think of 2021 with those, you know, sort of nice, lazy uptrend. I always call it like a stepwise bullish phase uh, where you have brief pullbacks that aren't that painful. You sort of keep making new highs. Leadership is clear. Uh, that's what 2021 was like. It seems a lot easier now looking back two years later. What a, what a straightforward bull phase. 2022, 2023, I think we've had to work at it a little bit, a little bit harder. And now we're once again in that, in that environment where volatility could certainly spike. I would be looking at the chart of the VIX. If you don't watch that, I would be watching that to see if you get that uh, further move to the upside, which would most likely indicate 
uh, further downside retrenchment for the major averages. In terms of interest rates, a little bit of a mixed bag uh, today, five and 10 year points both moving a bit higher, but not by much. Ten-year yields just below 4.3 percent, uh, and the long bond yield was down slightly, but still uh, around 436, we'll call it. The dollar index, not much of a change from yesterday, and that's a, that's a bit different. We've seen a strong dollar here in recent weeks, so taking a bit of a pause from that upswing in the uh, dollar versus other currencies. On the commodity page, we have the DBC, a broad commodity ETF, up by about a quarter of a percent, but it was certainly not helped from any of the metals. Precious metals like gold and silver both down, the GLD down about half a percent, the SLV, the silver ETF, down 1.6 percent, copper prices lower as well. Crude oil prices pushing higher, and uh, as we get to uh, some of the charts here, one of the few sectors just showing strength amidst market uh, uncertainty Energy and higher crude oil prices, certainly part of a bullish thesis for the uh, XLE or some of the other energy uh, ETFs, continuing to kind of get it done there for, uh, for crude oil. Finally, cryptocurrencies, not much of a change, kind of a noisy day. You can see a little preview chart on the left side of my screen, pretty choppy, but at the end, Bitcoin not really moving much directly, down about uh, directionally, down about 0.4% to 25,700, we'll call it, and Ether just above 1630. Finally, looking at sectors, utilities at the top of the list, and I'm going to take a moment to enjoy that because I haven't been able to say that, I don't think at all, in quite some time. Utilities have been underperforming dramatically with the other defensive sectors, right? Pure defense, I tend to think of as utilities, real estate, consumer staples. All three of those sectors have been underperforming on a relative basis uh, for quite some time. This is not a new uh, phenomenon. And one of the things we've been talking about is looking for new strength in some of those defensive sectors. When I have a sense of where the market is and what sort of positioning there is, what, what you're looking for is a change, right? Something that tells you something's different. Utilities at the top of the list, one day isn't enough to move the needle, but seeing utilities improve on a relative basis would certainly be a different uh, environment, what I would call a change of character. Still not a lot of appreciation from consumer staples. A lot of the uh, stocks in that sector uh, continue to struggle in our uh, live Q&A we did earlier today. And thanks for those of you that, uh, that join me live uh, every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern for our live Q&A. Talked about consumer staple stocks, charts like ADM and uh, Campbell Soup and General Mills and others, which have been in just in these rough decline periods, uh, you know, no real, uh, you know, new uh, deterioration. There are a handful of names that consumer staples doing okay, like Albertsons comes to mind, grocery store kind of breaking out, uh, but the average consumer staple stock still uh, struggling quite a bit. So you're not seeing a real dramatic move to the defensive side of the ledger. Today, the growthy stuff, for the most part, at the bottom of the list with technology and consumer discretionary, both down about 1% for the day today. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500. You can see the drawings that I actually made on, on, the, uh, on the webcast uh, earlier on our live q and I'll show you what we were talking about here. I was sort of speculating on what we might be experiencing here uh, with what we call an ABC correction. Now, I am, full disclosure, not an Elliott Wave aficionado. It is not the core part of my toolkit, as you probably know if you've watched the show for any length of time. But I always find it interesting to talk to people who are more focused on Elliott Wave and other disciplines like GAN that I don't use every day because it's interesting to see where their conclusions end up using a very different toolkit than my own. And I, I've always found that to be a pretty interesting uh, intellectual exercise. When I apply sort of an Elliott Wave hat that I, I dust off and pop on here, you could see this as sort of a, an ABC correction. Or, you know, what that basically means is after a major top, you have a corrective three-wave move, that initial move lower, and then the bounce higher. And this is when buy on the dip seems like a really good idea because it feels like just another higher low as we continue higher. But then this next wave lower really catches people on the wrong side of things. This is when people start to believe, okay, maybe this is something a little more significant and you really want to start thinking a little more uh, defensively. The interesting thing about that, if this is the beginning of that wave, and I'm just thinking of today with the S&P closing back below the 50-day, does that sort of confirm this rotation to, uh, to the downside? And if so, if you do the traditional measurement technique, which would say wave A and wave C are about the same, look where that takes us down to. It's right to this trend line we've been talking about for a couple months now, which is the October low from last year, the March low from this year, right around 42, 42, 50, we'll call it, uh, as of... Uh, uh, as of a couple weeks out, which is where this measurement would end up if 
it was a similar parallel move. It's right around 4,200 uh, right about now. So what's interesting is if you would have an ABC correction, kind of a classic corrective move, a three-wave move, that would take us down to a low right around, we'll call it below 4,300, right at trend line support, just above the 200-day moving average, just above a key Fibonacci level. Uh, in the third week of September, which is an options expiration week, um, you know, it almost is kind of lining up. I'm, now, I would be blown away if the markets are that perfectly laid out uh, ahead of time, but, uh, but I'll, I'll take it. I think that's a decent bear case to, uh, to think about. And then the question is, what's next after that? And I'll, I'll save that for my conversation with Harry Wall, because I think he probably has some ideas about what may come after this uh, sort of correction, uh, sort of pullback phase that we, uh, that we may be in. But that's sort of the base case that I'm looking at. Again, today's drawdown you know, seems to, to further validate that pullback uh, sort of environment that we've been talking about. Now, different ways we can think about what this pullback may mean is a couple different things. We can look at individual stocks, and we'll look at Apple and Microsoft here next. Or we can look at measures of breadth and, uh, and, and sentiment, which we'll look at as well here to round out our, uh, our market recap. So today, of course, Apple, if you missed it, down about 3.6% today. A uh, decent down day, one of the worst days we've seen in a while since that gap lower uh, about a month ago in early August. Uh, Apple, by the way, has a, a big product announcement coming up. I think it's next Tuesday on the 12th, uh, if I remember right. Uh, so something to pay attention to. What's, what's interesting about the chart of Apple, though, is we gapped lower uh, early August. We traded a bit lower here, traded back higher. Look how we found resistance right at this gap again, at the upper end of the gap right around 190. That has now served as resistance. We're back below the 50-day. So kind of a classic breakdown, retest, and then a further rotation lower. That's a pretty standard look with, uh, with charts. If you've looked at enough charts, you've seen this pattern many, many times. And so immediately has me thinking more uh, defensively on a chart like this. The uh, uh, stock topped out here uh, this week right at an RSI level of 60. And if you uh, followed work by like Connie Brown and others, they talk about that whole range of the RSI moving lower in a bearish phase, the whole range moving higher in a bullish phase. So look at the range of the RSI for much of 2023, right? After starting the year off very strong, after a very, after a very uh, weak December, sort of turned on a dime, rallied in January. And then for most of the rest of that time, the RSI is above 50. It's kind of con, you know, consistently strong. That's a sign of strong momentum, meaning the update Days are, are a lot stronger than the down days. That is a period of accumulation. But then look at how that changed in early August when we gap lower. The RSI goes all the way down to uh, just below 30. Now bouncing higher, the RSI is topping out right around 60. So the entire range for now appears to have uh, bumped lower. And again, just has me thinking uh, more defensively. Now, again, this is not saying Apple's going to go to 120, although that is theoretically possible. I would say highly unlikely. I would say much more likely we're in a corrective phase and we end up sort of in this, uh, in this sort of range. Again, take that same A, B, C, you know, drop and you figure low, you know, upper 160s, just above the 200-day moving average is about where that would play out if we have a similar drop to what we've seen uh, so far. Microsoft is uh, here not as dire as Apple because you don't have those gaps that uh, the gap that Apple did uh, and the retest. But Microsoft testing its 50-day moving average, the RSI again right around 60. Uh, so testing a potential area of resistance from below hasn't really regained the 50-day moving average yet. Sort of holding steady right around that point, which has served as a resistance uh, here in the last uh, in the last couple of weeks. So the problem for our major benchmarks are names like Apple and Microsoft, which have outsized weights and outsized impact on our cap-weighted benchmarks, struggling a little bit here over the last uh, month or two, and that is putting uh, some downside pressure on the major averages. Now, we can also look at some measures of breadth, and I'll just highlight quickly maybe one or two of those. Uh, one would be the percent of stocks above key moving averages. We've talked about this chart a little bit recently, but you know, just to confirm, as of today, and really yesterday we dropped a bit, uh, we're uh, down to around 35% of the S&P 500 above their 50-day moving average. So to be clear, Two out of every three S&P names are below their 50-day moving average, just like the S&P is as of today's close. That's not a bullish configuration. Bullish is when we're above 50%, when most stocks are above this key sort of short-term uh, barometer. 50 or, uh, you know, two out of three being below that level uh, doesn't make me feel great about strength in the market today. Longer term, you look at some longer term moving averages. The S&P, of course, well above its own 200-day moving average, about 300 points above its own 200-day, which is here around 41.65. About 53% of the S&P in that same condition, still above their 200-day moving average. If you're bearish and you're looking for validation that the market really is pushing lower 
in a stronger and stronger fashion. I'll be looking at this chart here to see if and when we get below that 50% level. It doesn't guarantee that the S&P is going to go down another 20% or anything, but it does tell you that the breadth is getting a lot weaker than it was before uh, we broke below that 50% level. So I think this could be an important chart uh, to watch here. Another one to pay attention to is the McClellan Oscillator. Now, we update this after the close. I don't think that we have the uh, latest reading just yet, but highly likely we're going to get back below the zero level today. Uh, I've color-coded this green and red based on whether we're above or below uh, the zero line. And, and the McClellan Oscillator, based on advanced decline data, it's basically using some smoothing tools, some averages to uh, you know, look at the changing uh, character of the uh, advanced decline data. Turned positive here a couple weeks ago in late August after turning negative in early August as a great indication of the beginning of this pullback phase. Turned back positive here about a week ago, and now it looks like uh, highly likely as of today's close it'll break below the zero level. And, and again, that's not saying, you know, that's not really implying a particular downside objective. It's just telling you in the short term that the conditions are a lot weaker. So this sort of chart does two things. Number one, it tells you, it confirms when we're in a pullback phase, which I think it will do after today's close. And then it's going to uh, you know, help you anticipate when that downward phase may be over. And I would be looking at this chart. If we do validate with a break below zero, when do we get back above zero? That could be an all clear of sorts telling you we're on the next leg, uh, next leg higher. Uh, so for now, some breadth data has gone from being uh, quite bullish really to a uh, little more measured, a little, uh, little less optimistic. Two other charts I probably have time to, uh, to take a look at. You know, one of my favorite measures of offense versus defense is the consumer discretionary versus consumer staples ratio. I like to focus on the bottom series, which is the equal weighted version, kind of takes the overweight of Amazon, Tesla, Home Depot out of the numerator, and it's more of the average consumer discretionary stock versus the average consumer staple stock. Now, consumer staples have been struggling in a big way recently, so I'm not surprised to see the ratio continue higher, but... It does tell me to not be too negative. This ratio is actually making a new high for the year this week. I have this big red parabola line on here because I'm thinking, all right, this is the rotation lower. It hasn't really continued, right? It's actually breaking, broken back above there. I kept this on here just to remind, remind myself that that's what I was seeing in mid-August. It certainly felt like a toppy rotation, but it's actually completed that move and gone back to the upside. As long as this ratio keeps going up, Things just aren't getting that bad, and that's the general way that I would think about it. Finally, gold stocks. Talk about areas of the market. I think at the end of the day, we can speculate a lot about what should work or what could work. If you really want to focus on what is working and what is not working, which I would encourage you to do, look at the charts and focus on price action. Gold stocks have been a challenging place, and I'm not seeing a lot of reason for optimism just yet. Look at how we can come to that conclusion. We're making a pattern of lower highs and lower lows. Most recently, we made a new low, in uh, mid-August, undercutting the July low, we met a lower high here right at the 50-day moving average, undercutting the uh, July low by, uh, by plenty, and now rotating back lower a little bit. Look at the momentum, which overall is just firmly in that bearish range. So gold and gold stocks, while gold you know, coming off of an all-time high, it certainly could break above there, and I think that's possible. For now, the charts of the GLD, of the GDX, which are gold mining stocks, Certainly not showing uh, strength uh, to, the, uh, to the contrary, showing uh, continued signs of weakness. That's our market recap for today. I'm going to bring on today's guest, Ari Wald of Oppenheimer, here in a moment. Before I do so, a couple quick announcements. First off, don't forget to hit like, subscribe to our channel. We would so appreciate both of those things. Go ahead and do it right now. I'll wait. All right. Now that we're back, email us any questions that you have. We're going to do a mailbag segment on Friday's show, and we'd love to incorporate your question into our broadcast. You can email us your questions at thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. On X, just tag us in a comment at FinalBarSCTV. And of course, on our YouTube channel, just drop a comment below the video that you're watching. We would so love to hear from you, and we'll answer your question, we hope, in our next mailbag segment on Friday's show. I want to bring on today's guest, Ari Wald. Ari is the head of technical analysis at Oppenheimer, coming to us live from New York. Ari, back to school time. How are you feeling about the market conditions here as we go into uh, September? Well, Dave, thanks for having me back. It's been about a month. I feel like a real regular contributor to Final Bar here. I appreciate it uh, being back. And here's what I think. You know, we're not out of the woods just yet. In fact, I really, really like the idea of the three waves down argument that you were discussing. We've been talking about that in our reports as well. Uh, a, a down up down move where we could be in this final stage, a less intense setback into late September. 
You know, the point we are stressing, though, to our clients is that we do see this as an opportunity mm -hmm. for the long term investor to buy into what I think is still a middle innings bull market cycle. And, and the reason we're saying that, that 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 we believe that the bull cycle is still intact is is the action underneath the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, we're I think internal breadth is broader or at least moving in the right direction as, as we've been putting it. It's been the right leadership, even our inner market checks looking at credit spreads. And so th thinking in terms of leadership, you know, very similar to your consumer discretionary versus consumer staples chart, one ratio we like to look at is that of high beta cyclicals versus uh, low volatility defenses. That's in that bottom panel. And what we're showing here is that it's trending higher with the market coming off. It's a, a new cycle high in July, but no major damage in that. And what that indicates to us is that through the setback, we uh, cyclicals are being accumulated. We think defensives are being distributed. Looking at those defensive REITs and staples and utilities, those are all the sectors that are still pointed lower in our relative work. And, and kind of conversely, we think that's a positive for the market. Uh, and so for these reasons, again, why we think this is a counter trend pullback that should start to turn higher as seasonals improve. We've been following that seasonal trajectory just so closely. It's interesting. I think a lot of investors kind of oversimplify in some ways, right? And we just think, is it going up or is it down, right? Are, are people all in on offense or are they all defensive? And there's a little bit more of a nuance, as you and I, you and I know, and I, I think with that ratio, you're really showing how, you know, longer term, you're still seeing strength in the things you'd want to be strong in a in a bullish in a bullish long term uh, tape for sure. Talk to us a little bit about small caps. This is an area of the market that I think has been, you know, certainly underperforming more sideways while other things have been been rallying. What's your take on the Russell 2000 here? What does that mean? I, that's the most important gauge as it stands for us. I, and I think generally speaking, I always like to look at the extremes. What's the most bullish? What's the most bearish? The most bullish right now, tech-related indices like the NASDAQ 100, which in our view, no harm here. Still above its breakout on an equally weighted basis. Again, the strength broader than I think a lot of investors give it credit for. Uh, likely to continue to lift the market higher, albeit, you know, again, still in this consolidation phase. Then you look at what's not working. It's the Russell 2000, it's small cap, still stuck below its August of 2022 peak, still in the spacing attempt. This is what's held back internal breadth. We look at small caps as uh, the Russell 2000 as a proxy for internal breadth. Now our bullish argument is actually based on the directional improvement that we're seeing here. It's that from a year in 2022 when nothing was working, we're seeing small caps start to base and turn higher. Uh, and actually, it's it's selling that's become more concentrated. Mm. So we like to ask our question, at what point is that assumption no longer valid? At what point are we wrong? And it would be a breakdown in that Russell 2000. If that Russell 2000 breaks lower and that base fails to hold, then at that point, we are at risk to see breadth expand to the downside and the leaders get dragged lower with it. So bent but not broken as it stands, something we're watching closely. And I think it's that's an important point that uh, very often the warning is in the weak, not the strong. It's not tech right now. It's really in banks and watching the Russell 2000. Is there going to be any sort of issues there? So far, we're, we're not seeing it in the charts. It's so interesting. I want to get to uh, just look at a chart of the S&P here really quick with you, uh, with you, Ari. Um, you know, we talk about uh, the Russell 2000 small caps certainly have, have, have been struggling, you know, sideways, really consolidating more than anything. But you mentioned a breakdown in small caps could be an indication that things really are starting to get a little bit worse. When you're looking at the higher level, let's say the ABC kind of correction or the, you know, the, the three wave pattern does not play out and we actually continue. Is there a certain level that would tell you, okay, this is now something more significant, really do need to get defensive. You know, what would you need to see that would confirm a, a less optimistic thesis? When should investors start to really get cautious here? So my, so right, so obviously it would be the risk. It, uh, the scenario I'm gonna lay out would probably corroborate with small caps breaking lower and mm. dragging the, these uh, larger cap weighted benchmarks with it. Uh, I'm of the Paul Tudor Jones rule. If something falls below the 200 day, you have to cut it. That's mm. not a holy grail, 
but generally kind of very a simple demarcation line between bull and bear. So from uh, my estimation, the S&P's trend is higher down to 4,200. Yeah. Uh, that's a 200 day. If you fail to then uphold the breakout level from the February peak as well, you know, then then there's some uh, it's it's deeper than just a setback in an uptrend. How, how we how we view it. Mm, that's well said. And I, and I love the simplicity of that. Right. I mean, and, and, and what I always tend to think of it is like a line in the sand. As long as we hold the 200 day Things probably aren't getting that bad, but if that starts to fail, then I would be, you know, at least be reevaluating how your your position. We should make a point, by the way, Ari. You're bringing all weekly charts with you, which I think is a really interesting, and, and I'm not surprised because you you have a really uh, uh, strong and consistent process. But in a period of market choppiness, why is it important to focus on the weekly time frame as opposed to the short term, daily and hourly? How would you think of that? Well, you know, for us, uh, the the near term dailies, you could get caught up in the noise very often. Mm -hmm. I, I would joke around if you want me to analyze a daily chart, expect different answers every day. And that's <laughs> to our clients. You know, we we try to have strike a consistent tone. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, looking at a time horizon, say even measured three to six months out, which um, I, I probably has even become uh, you know more of a longer term time horizon, just given the short termism in the market these days, but. I think it's so important to really you you want all the time horizons to line up and it is important mm -hmm. to look at the right now what's happening but I want the right now to align with the longer term that's when you really have a compelling story to make. Mm, no, well well said. Now let's get to something that actually is working. We do have charts that are going higher here and you're highlighting one of them uh, in the chart that you share with me looking at a, a particular uh, group within the energy space. Talk to us about energy and what this means to see renewed strength here. I, I hear you talk about it all the time, Dave. It's what's working right now. Uh, it's so important to understand, and that's energy. I mean, that's been the key Q3 trade, how, how we've seen it. Again, it, it hasn't been a rotation to the safe havens. Uh, it's been a move back into the, the, the energy sector, which is a cyclical area. I think that's a, a reason why some of those uh, offensive high beta ratios are, are still ticking higher. And what I see from this chart is a sector that's been moving sideways for much of the last 18 months and is now starting to show signs of re reversing to the upside, which would potentially mark a resumption of a breakout dating back to 2018. And even in this chart, which we're not even showing, if you were to take back that even farther for the EMP industry in particular, that would mark a breakout even above the 2014 high as mm. well so really setting up after again just this 18 month malaise let allowing the moving averages to catch up the price you know from those excesses uh that we saw in 2022 uh now you have a firmer center of gravity and, and i think the sector is possibly positioned to to um, jump to the upside as it clears these resistance actually i am showing emp in particular because it has those features that the xla does not. So I, I think in terms of there is a structural shift, and I'm unsure if it's going to be a broad base move throughout the sector, but uh, the EMP pocket in particular, a real standout in terms of those long term charts uh, that we were just discussing, Dave. Uh, it's a great, great example of an area of the market showing showing strength here, while I think other areas are, are struggling area. Yeah, so as you as you probably know, I, I have the the pleasure of speaking to technical analysts and chart people often on the show. I know you spend a lot of your time talking with people who are not chart people who are looking at fundamentals and macroeconomic data and all of that. You know, there's a lot of discussion certainly going into the peak June into July about overvaluations, particularly in the growth space. How do you reconcile? I mean, Apple and Microsoft have come off, but still, you know, a lot of the growth names sort of overvalued based on traditional definitions. How do you reconcile a long-term bullish technical thesis with fundamental valuations that seem overheated? Yeah, and this has been the issue the entire year as we think about a disconnect between the signals in the chart and the signals, the macro concerns that, I, that we've been hearing since the fourth quarter of last year. I don't know if the gap's ever been wider. Uh, and so that's why it's so important to stick to discipline and why we listen to price. I mean, obviously, it's about the mosaic and understanding uh, all the, the, what the concerns are and addressing them. But if an investor is going to get paid on price, it's so important to, to uh, 
have that as a key piece of the process. And, and we've looked and we addressed a lot of those concerns, whether it's the failure for economic data to support the rally. We've, we've looked at uh, studies based on the yield curve and valuations and relative valuations. And what we've come to the conclusion for each one of those, what we've kind of stated to investors that is that a lot of those concerns are overstated, that if you looked at each one individually, that uh, that doesn't mean the market can't move to the upside. Uh, so it's, um, again, why price is so important. It might be a late cycle economy. You know, we are assuming that this is a bull cycle coming out of a non-recessionary bear market cycle. We've seen this before. 87 crash, non-recession, mm. bear, 88, 89 bull market into the 1990 recession. So there is a recession potentially lurking out there. The market is signaling is that that risk is not imminent. And if you look back historically, these bull market cycles, on average, can last two and a half years, uh, rise 70% bottom to top. Uh, mm. I'm, we're even going to be conservative here. If you look at even the more muted bull market cycles, we think a conservative estimate would be, uh, let's say, an 18-month rise uh, with a 50% move in terms of magnitude. And by those conservative projections, uh, we still think that the S&P is undervalued uh, based on our cycle work. That's a fantastic description. I love this, this breakdown. There's a little market history lesson in there too, Ari. Listen, great to see you. Thanks for bringing some charts giving us some things to think about. Be well, stay cool there in the Northeast, and we'll talk to you again soon. Talk to you soon, Dave. Thanks. Bye now. That's Ari Wall. There is the head of technical analysis at Oppenheimer coming to us uh, from uh, New York. Great discussion there. And I, lo I love his uh, point about valuations and, and just the relationship. And, and, and he's absolutely right. I've had so many conversations like that of people as, as charts go higher telling me why that shouldn't be the case. And my answer always is, doesn't matter what you think the chart should be doing. The price is going up. Why don't we follow that? That's that's what the goal is, right? Great take there, as always, by Eric Wald of Oppenheimer. Folks, we've got to wrap the show. Go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Chart number one, we're talking breadth. We talked about the breadth conditions. I love Ari's uh, comments about the, the small caps, using that as sort of a proxy for breadth and certainly a proxy for, for risk appetite. I think that is a, uh, a very valid point. When we're looking at things like the McClellan Oscillator, stocks above a certain moving averages, these are all just different ways of measuring strength. Now, the McClellan Oscillator, to be clear, a short-term gauge, right? It's really not telling you longer-term cycles. It's more about the short-term dynamics. And this is more of a tactical part of my toolkit. I like to know, are we below, above or below that zero line? If we're above the zero line, conditions are good. Stocks in the short term are going higher. This is a, a, a an upswing uh, overall. When the conditions are, when it's below zero, when it's shaded red on this chart, tells you the conditions are deteriorating and we're most likely in a bit of a pullback phase. As of today's close, this isn't updated for today's close just yet, but when it is, I would say highly likely this goes below zero. Could be a confirmation, assuming we get a valid uh, confirmation tomorrow uh, at the close would, uh, would suggest further deterioration in the short term. It sort of lines up with that three-wave corrective pattern we've been uh, speculating on. Chart number two, NVIDIA. We didn't talk a lot about semiconductors in our market recap. It's certainly one of the areas of the market that has remained fairly strong over the long term. Long-term story could be strong, but in the short term, I'm seeing continued signs of, uh, of questionable trend strength. Uh, NVIDIA down 3% today, not the end of the world. Still above an ascending 50-day moving average. That's encouraging. But this is one of those areas of the market where we've seen bearish momentum divergences. What that represents is when the price is moving higher and the momentum is actually trending lower. Most recently, we made a new 52-week high for NVIDIA over the last week, but the RSI didn't even get to the overbought region. So we've had this succession of higher highs in price and a succession of lower peaks in RSI. This is a classic topping pattern, usually indicating we're at the end of a bullish phase. Now, again, I think that tells, sort of lines up with some of the evidence we've talked about suggesting we're in this short-term corrective period. Again, what that means relative to the long-term, that's where some weekly charts could be really helpful. One more breakdown to highlight. This is one, if you look at, look at Las Vegas Sands and what's happened here, I would say a confirmed, what we call a complex head and shoulders. And if you know your technical analysis, price patterns, go back to your Edwards and McGee book, a classic book on uh, price patterns written, oh boy, probably 40, 50 years ago, I want to say, maybe more. Um, but uh, basically looks at 
uh, price uh, congestion patterns and reversal patterns. And if you look here, a complex head and shoulders is a head, two left shoulders, two right shoulders, basically just means a, you know, instead of a simple head and shoulders pattern, you have more shoulders than you'd expect, but a very clearly defined neckline, with which, we which we certainly do. It broke below that neckline, now retested it from below and rotating lower. And that retest of the neckline also lines up with the retest of the 200 day moving average. Gambling stocks had been a really strong part of the market October of last year, really through the second quarter. Look at how the relative strength was so strong during that period. But now the relative strength has, de has deteriorated as things like energy are doing just fine. But areas of the market like gambling stocks showing some new signs of weakness. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Don't forget our YouTube live Q&A. We had a great one today at 1 p.m. Eastern. Don't miss next Wednesdays as well. Special thanks to Ari Wald of Oppenheimer joining us from New York. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.